Heads up, this episode of Schmeitgeist contains some strong language. Mostly directed at landlords. ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. So really the whole point of this podcast series is to look at what's changing. You know, weird patterns in culture that tell us something about where we're all heading. But this lecture hall at the University of Technology, Sydney, is honest to God, a time machine. Like, nothing has changed since I last did this. Can everybody hear me? And if you need to see me, obviously, um, move out of the way of the computer. The fluorescent lighting, the miniature tables that are slightly too small for your laptop. They're even asking the same questions in... I'll record on my phone. Where am I? Right, week five of a course called Global Economy. We're going to do a straw poll. Uh, yes, no, and I'm undecided. Do you think capitalism can be reformed to make it better? And here's where the time machine breaks down. Because asking that question about capitalism now will get you a totally different answer to what you would have heard in the past. I would say no. Um, no, because it's generally quite bad. Oh, no. No, I guess. Kill capitalism. Goodbye. People feel that way for a range of reasons. We shouldn't be protecting business. And you're exploiting children. Purely, it's not something that works for people. It doesn't make sense to value some people getting richer over everyone being better off. I sort of want to live on a farm one day with a bunch of mates build a commune, we will have our babies and raise our babies together. <laughs> and look, there are still some fans out there. Because I'm currently sitting in my Subaru Forester and I've actually come to terms with the fact that I have to be okay with capitalism. But for most Gen Zs and millennials, this is the actual C-bomb. The biggest problem with capitalism is that there's actually nothing wrong with capitalism. It's doing exactly what it should. Take it from me when I say that systems of economic management were not a hot topic of conversation 10 years ago. But now we even have a cute nickname for the cost of living crisis. Cosy Live is fucked. And I just got an email from my real estate agent saying they want to raise our rent. Moving is so expensive, but staying is going to fucking kill us. I don't know what to fucking do. And some people are furious. Working on their rat race just so we can go to work the next day to earn another 20 bucks to put in the car so we can drive to work the next day to earn another 20 bucks to put in the car so we can drive to work the next day. And they are eliminating the ways that we have previously had to extricate ourselves from this system. I'm Ange Lavoie-Pierre, and this is Schmeitgeist, the podcast from ABC Everyday that decodes the biggest and weirdest trends in pop culture, coming to you from Gadigal Land. And in this episode, we want to know how pretty much everyone under 40 turned on capitalism. In fact, maybe you already know. Most young people are not confident that either their life will be better than their parents or that capitalism in general can deal with the climate crisis, the crisis of inequality. And those kinds of crises are everyone's problem, which means you should probably forget what you thought you knew about the left-right political spectrum. Because anti-capitalism is no longer just a left-wing project. If someone was making a right-wing critique of capitalism in favour of monarchy or theocracy or a caste system, I would say that I'm happy to take neoliberal capitalism any day because that type of political economy seems rather vile to me. I would prefer to not live as a serf in really any scenario. So what happens next if the better part of two generations, most of whom can now vote, have lost faith in capitalism? I think what you're watching is a disintegration of the centre as things get more and more difficult for more and more people they're going to shed to the fringe. It's not automatic that things will go in a progressive, more just path. That's a political fight, right, that all of us are involved in. I'm just a bit burnt out by it and want to go work in a cafe in Hobart and ride bicycles. <laughs> That's it. That's the dream. So it's hard to say exactly when I noticed that capitalism was this widely reviled because it happened kind of gradually. But there was a moment earlier this year when it really smacked me in the face and I realised that something fundamental had shifted. 
It was a story that exploded on one particular corner of the internet, the corner labelled Depop Resellers. And if you're not acquainted, Depop is a Gen Z skewing online marketplace where people sell each other clothes, mostly secondhand, which is how we ended up with a subgenre of TikToks known as the thrift haul. At the thrift store today. I'm back on the hunt at my local Goodwill outlet store. The people here are vultures and so am I. The next step in a thrift haul is going through each item, ideally trying them all on. Starting off strong with this gorgeous denim corset. This vintage coach bag. Who is donating these things? This like nighty duster, um, obsessed six bucks. It had like a little like vintage tag. I think it's vintage, it looks vintage. That's my telltale signs if it's like yellowing and old looking. Anyway, beautiful, love it on. Textbook examples of the genre. So in late January, this bubbly 19-year-old Depop reseller named Jack, with a TikTok handle JB Wells 2, posted a clip of her latest haul. Something she does very regularly, like every few days. This might be too big of a statement, but I really don't think I'm over-exaggerating. This right here is the best thrift haul you will ever see. I've been manifesting one of these coats for I don't even know how long. And the fact I actually found it, like, this one is so good too. This Preston and York one has the cutest white trim on it. But this one blew up. And not in a good way. At the time we're recording, 6.7 million people have watched it. And there are more than 10,000 comments. Some positive. You know, threatening to rob her, but as a compliment on her great curation. And others calling her a landlord. Now, the landlord take on Depop resellers wasn't new. It had been getting around on TikTok and Twitter for a few months by that point. Specifically about people who thrift, then upsold the stuff they bought cheap for a much higher price. And overnight... Jack became the poster girl. I don't know if this is going to make sense, but if you're the kind of person who goes to thrift stores in order to sell good items at a higher price, you are a landlord. These Depop girlies going to these charity shops, getting loads of great pieces and selling them off for like, like more than five times the price. Like you're really sitting there making 100% profit on things that could be bought by people that actually need it. And they've somehow made a career out of gentrifying buying clothes secondhand. And look, there is a whole debate to be had on this topic about clothes going to landfill and fast fashion and who the real villain is. But the more interesting part, I think, is that what you essentially have here is a spontaneous mass moral crisis about the ethics of what is a pretty standard practice in modern capitalism. And it's not happening on some socialist subreddit. It's happening in the open air on what you might have assumed was a relatively apolitical corner of fashion talk. And this was when it hit me just how far out the gate anti-capitalist sentiment was. Like at some point in the last, I don't know, five years, landlord has become a byword for exploitative, at least to this generation. And if that's the kind of vitriol coming to a metaphorical landlord over their $40 profit on a polyester maxi dress, then you can guess what renters are posting about their actual landlords. It's currently playing out on TikTok in pretty much every Australian capital city. Just looking at memes online about the rental crisis in Australia, I mean, Marx would be having a field day. My rent is going up. $700 per fortnight. I call this edition things that should be illegal but apparently aren't. You can just call it slumlord fuckery for short. I officially have $50 left for the week. There are more empty homes in this country than there are homeless people. It's not about having empty homes. It's about who gets to control those homes, who is the person who owns the homes. And this is one of the main differences between millennial ideas about privilege from, say, 10 years ago and what the conversation is now. Ten years ago, class was a much smaller part of the discussion. For example, we didn't have a term for Nepo babies. Nepo babies, of course, being the adult kids of rich and or famous people, such as Johnny Depp. Lily Rose Depp is one of the Nepo babies that I expected more from. I expected her to not only realise that she grew up with extreme privilege, but she has a career because of who her parents are. You cannot convince me that Lily Rose Depp can walk a Chanel show based off of her own talent. So when you look, there are signs. It's Nepo babies, it's savage takedowns of Depop resellers, the word landlord being used almost solely as a slur. The generational mood on capitalism has shifted. Someone who saw this coming from further away than I did was political economist Dr Elizabeth Humphreys. She was a uni lecturer you heard earlier asking a room full of undergrads about whether or not capitalism was fixable. How long have you been explaining kind of capitalism 101 to a bunch of people in this 
this age group. Yeah, I've been teaching for seven years here and a few before that at Sydney Uni. It's definitely the case that young people, it's not just about criticism of capitalism, but whether they feel confident that capitalism can be reformed to make it better. The students in this subject are obviously interested in social change. That's partly why they've um, chosen the degree. But even when we talk to our students in our big core first year units, so I get a better sense from them because we've got film students and journalism students, music students, people who wanna go into advertising and PR, younger people, and this reflects research, are very suspicious of politicians and suspicious that things won't or can't get better. Young people are more critical of capitalism and more open to hearing about alternatives to um, capitalism. And you're absolutely right. 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you did not see the words capitalism or socialism in newspapers, on social media, but it's, it's present in the mainstream media in a way that it wasn't in the past as well. They're picking up on the same antipathies and concerns um, that people are articulating informally on social media. So Elizabeth has noticed a growing anti-capitalist sentiment in this age group over the last decade. And surveys from the US, the UK and Australia all show the same pattern. So nearly 80% of British millennials and Gen Z blame capitalism for the housing crisis. And 75% believe climate change is specifically a capitalist problem. In the US, a 2018 poll found that only 45% of young Americans had a favourable view of capitalism, down from 68% in 2010 which seems low given America's de facto status as capitalism's main cheerleader on the global stage. But more surprising again is research from the same year showing that 59% of Australian millennials believed that capitalism had failed. And there's this famous saying, right, that if you're not a socialist at 25, you have no heart. But if you're not a conservative at 35, you have no brain. The thing is, millennials are 35. And they're not drifting to the right. Instead, they're becoming the first generation to break that rule en masse. Honestly, you can see it. Most young people I talk to are not confident that either their life will be better than their parents or that capitalism in general can deal with the climate crisis, the crisis of inequality, the legacies of colonialism, racism. And that's not a confidence thing that we need to like just G them up with, you know, some better, more peppy thinking. These are people who live in the world, are reflecting on that world, are seeing deep inequality and are not confident that these can be fixed within capitalism. I think that's at the centre of um, why they think it. And if you're part of this group, I don't need to tell you, but one of the main engines behind that total lack of confidence in capitalism that Elizabeth's been describing is the fact that Gen Z and millennials have always had a hard time accruing any real wealth at a point in history when essentials like healthcare, food and education have become more expensive. And housing is at the centre of it. At the moment, 55% of Australian millennials own a home. By contrast, 62% of Gen X had bought into the market at the same stage in life as had 66% of boomers. And it's not hard to draw a straight line between losing a game and hating a game. But Elizabeth thinks it's not just self-interest at play here. The students I deal with and the young people I deal with in some ways are quite privileged. A lot of them have been to great schools, they've gotten into great universities. They're reasonably confident that they're actually going to find good jobs and have enjoyable lives. Part of their antipathy towards capitalism is not about themselves, but it's about the other injustices and inequalities they see around them. Whatever their motives, millennials are kind of the crash test dummies for this totally new pattern in politics where we just never, as a whole, become significantly more conservative. And that played out in a huge way at the 2022 Australian federal election. Tonight, the Australian people have voted for change. The electoral patterns are definitely more mixed in the UK and particularly in the US because obviously it's a totally different circus with different monkeys. But here, the coalition's millennial vote fell from 38% to 25% over the last two elections. So millennials are going in the opposite direction to what history predicts. And in the same period, 67% of Gen Z voted for either Labor or the Greens. 
No other generation of Australians has skewed that far left at the same age. But there is a flip side to that pattern, because not everyone is lurching in the same direction. My name is Joshua Citarella. I'm an artist and internet culture researcher. For the last few years, I've been diving deep into Gen Z emergent political phenomena on social media. I was reading a piece of yours the other day, and you you said something that, that really kind of Um, piqued my interest. You said that in the last few years, a generation of young people have become radicalized on social media. I I was hoping to start there and that you could tell me what exactly you meant by that. Yeah, I would say that the Gen Z political spectrum is much broader than millennials, much broader than Gen X. For the millennial generation, you know, we saw what the world was like before social media, but uh, Gen Z has not. You know, uh, millennials were the early adopters of Web2 technologies, you know, platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of these types of things. And um, Gen Z is kind of thrust into that world without the benefit of having been on there early. You know, there are substantial political crises facing them. And under those rather unique conditions, people uh, come up with a variety of solutions. And some of those solutions are radical. Josh isn't researching the mainstream. He's focused on the fringe. He profiles young people with incredibly specific, often extreme political views, like the 17-year-old Irish nationalist who's against immigration but is also a Marxist, or the American 17-year-old who's worried about climate change and big business but thinks widespread gun ownership is the best solution. There are even high school-aged fans of the philosophies of the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. So Kaczynski is a former maths professor who killed three people and injured 23 others using mail bombs, which he sent over 15 years up until his arrest in the mid-90s. He also wrote a manifesto. Ted no longer wanted to live in this passive, numbed, comfortable lifestyle. Ted hated society. He wanted to revert back to what is truly felt, caring only about the simple things. And the Kaczynski Manifesto is exactly the kind of obscure material that the internet has made more accessible and shareable in the last decade. There's a tremendous archive of information that's available to people that if you were uh, a millennial who who didn't have dial-up internet, you know, I mean, when I was like uh, 12 or whatever, um, there was no way I was going to find out who Amadeo Bordiga was or anything about left communism or any variety of other uh, niche political philosophy. That access to information has certainly done a lot, for sure. And I don't want to overstate the size of movements like this. They are niche. But those political fringes Josh is studying are important because they're a magnification of something that's also happening in the mainstream. Really, what this research shows is that Gen Z politics got weird really quickly. Josh has been monitoring it since most of them were still in high school. When I first started this work in 2018, the age demographic was roughly 12 to 17 years old. So people would find an anonymous Twitter account, for example, and they would assume this was someone who had ardent, died in the wolves, political conviction. That does not seem to be the case. And there's a lot of role play type of activity where people experiment with different political ideologies. You will sometimes find people who run accounts uh, where one of them is aligned with, say, anarcho-capitalism. The other one is aligned with mutualism. Another one might be aligned with individualism, primitivism. Which is wild, right? Because I don't think I could even give you a working definition of political primitivism. But in 2018, there were 12-year-olds who could have. Because by the time they had questions about politics, the internet had answers. But even assuming some of those teenage Ted Kaczynski fans mellow with age, you can see how the traditional left-to-right political spectrum is totally obsolete here. So right-to-left is very familiar to people. There's also the very popular meme, which I'm sure many internet users have no doubt seen at this point, the political compass, which shows, just to sketch it out because I realize we're we're on audio here, there is an XY grid. The X axis runs from right-to-left. The Y grid runs from authority authoritarian to libertarian. And this gives you an increased resolution of political activity. So when you get into niche internet cultures, there are many, many more than just two axes. So that political compass Josh just mentioned is enough of a thing that it's even been applied to Mario, as in Luigi's brother of Super Mario fame. Mario is clearly (laughs) anti-abortion. He adheres to the Italian Catholic faith. Because of his union ties, I'll still give him a little bit of left, but he's going right there for me. The results were authoritarian right, in case you were wondering. And there are a bunch of subreddits devoted to even more detailed political surveys, which map people across four or even eight axes, which sounds exhausting. And it is. But they exist because people are blending beliefs that almost never used to coexist. Take, for example, a YouTuber named Haz al-Din, who's a fan of not only Karl Marx, but also Donald Trump, 
Oh, you're like a MAGA guy. You're a communist, but you support MAGA? Yeah, the extent to which I support Trump as a communist with a capital C is the same extent to which the Democrats and libshit America have not learned from Trump. And this is how we arrive at Gen Z's right-wing anti-capitalism. People who are all for a redistribution of wealth, but would sooner die than vote for a Bernie Sanders type or the Greens. We're at a fork in the road right now because some of those criticisms from the right indicate we could have the broad coalition and get some of the important stuff done that I'd like to see. It also means that there are people who would enact some pretty brutal, ruthless policies um, and maybe retreat into extreme senses of uh, nationalism that, you know, given the worst scenarios for climate change, would close the borders, refuse refugees, create bare bones benefits that are tied to citizenship and ethnicity in some cases. So if someone was making a right wing critique of capitalism in favor of monarchy or theocracy or a caste system, I would say that I'm happy to take neoliberal capitalism any day because <laughs> that type of that type of political economy seems rather vile to me. I would prefer to not live as a serf in really any scenario. So just to be clear, what Josh is talking about there when he says a broad coalition is a critical mass of people opposed to capitalism as it stands, as in enough to change it. The question is exactly how broad? Who else is in this tent? Because if you look, you will find anti-capitalist Nazis. Josh's research is a reflection of how the internet has pushed us off the political map. Most of all within the generations who've spent the largest portion of their lives on it. At the same time as those same generations have been locked out of economic opportunities. And that process is still unfolding. There may be economic promises from the right that win those people over. I think what you're watching is a disintegration of the centre as uh, things get more and more difficult for more and more people. They're going to shed to the fringe um, and they're going to take you know, whoever can promise them the best material well-being and, and possibilities for success in their society. If those things happen to come from a nationalist right, there may be people who will now move towards other nationalist ideologies. That's entirely possible. The task now is to kind of win over those hearts and minds uh, because people are really becoming increasingly open to these new narratives. Another possibility is that all the shitposting and depop rhetoric and fury about inequality never makes any real dent in capitalism. So at the start of this episode, when we asked that yes-no question, the people who said no often followed it up by explaining that they just couldn't think of an alternative. I just don't think we know a better system. I think I'd like to say no, but the answer is definitely yes. I would like to think that there's a system that works better. We don't really have any other choices but to kind of fuck with it. And that idea that there is no alternative has a name. The late British philosopher Mark Fisher came up with it in 2009. He called it capitalist realism. In a nutshell, it's the idea that we're probably stuck with capitalism because of the widespread belief that it's inevitable. And whether or not you agree there are alternatives, you can see how that might be a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. You know, the idea that the world can end, that's always in our minds. The idea that there was an alternative to capitalism, that has disappeared. Perhaps especially amongst anti-capitalists. Either way, millennials and Gen Z are currently in the process of abandoning the centre. And neither Josh Citarella or Elizabeth Humphreys can see them going back. The real test for that theory, though, comes in 10 to 20 years' time with something called the Great Wealth Transfer, which is really just a grandiose way of talking about the historical moment when millennials inherit from the boomer generation, at which point, theoretically, they'll be able to afford a cafe breakfast and a home. And that is when we find out if the anti-capitalist mood we're measuring now goes deeper than people's personal finances. Look, time will tell whether the things... Students who are 20 today think think it when they're 30 or 40. Even if wealth-wise and income-wise things work out okay for them, and some of them will do better than their parents have done, I'm not sure their concerns about questions, say, around justice for Indigenous people, the legacy of colonialism, Black Lives Matter, these are big issues that they've talked about all through high school. They come up all the time at university, both in class and informally. They are very attuned to 
the sorts of long-term 100, 200 year problems um, of the globe. And it's not just educated, lucky students in universities. Black Lives Matter is talked about everywhere in society. And, you know, if you're a tradie or you're working in hospitality, even if maybe you'll never go to university, people struggle individually, they see how others struggle, they see how their parents struggle, they see how, you know, grandparents can't afford nursing homes. Young people are taking all of that in, in order to make decisions about what they think. So I don't know what will happen, but I don't think people always are thinking just about themselves in economics. They're thinking also about everybody around them. And we do mean everyone up to and including whoever would have bought that gorgeous distressed denim Y2K vintage miniskirt at the charity store that's now listed for 50 bucks on Depop. Okay, the thing you're all waiting for, the IMG skirt. Oh my God, okay, I'm not a miniskirt girly, but I think I am now. How cute is this? I couldn't believe it. It fits so good. I think I'm converted. I picked up today's episode of Schmeichgeist at my local Goodwill for the bargain price of Grant Walter's remaining sanity. He's our producer and sound engineer. I think I'm going to keep him. Elsa Silverstein was also a bargain. She was reporting and producing on this episode. Just such a rare find. If you are looking for other bargains, you should totally subscribe to the ABC Listen app. I mean, it's literally free. That's where you can find our other episodes so far this season, including last week's deep dive into the horror genre. I'm pretty sure it's vintage. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.